All right, guys, I better get started here. I can see I picked the uh, popular topic, <laughs> but uh, it'll be good, I promise. Okay, I just want to make sure we get through it in the allotted time because I had a few extra slides in there, so I'm going to whip through them here. So this talk today is meant to be an overview of regenerative medicine and how it applies to urology. I don't go into too much detail on any one thing because uh, this is like a huge, huge field and there's tons of little intricacies to it. Um, but I but I do think it's worthwhile just to know what's out there and know the current state of this in terms of our practice. Um, so the objectives for this talk are going to be to define regenerative medicine, to outline the basic concepts of tissue engineering, to review the current concepts of regenerative med medicine in bladder augmentation, to briefly review other potential areas of regenerative medicine in urology, to outline roadblocks to its application in practice, and to discuss the future of regenerative medicine and urology. Those will be brief at the end. So um, people, when they think of regenerative medicine, they have different ideas of what it is. Cloning, could that be it? Growing organs, having biomaterials around. Frankenstein, that's what I sort of thought of when I sort of started doing it. It's sort of always regenerative medicine, really. An ear on the back of a mouse, that's sort of some crazy stuff. But basically this uh, paper came out by Dar and Greenwood and they, they saw there was a bunch of different definitions out there. Now their definition that they've proposed is quite lengthy, so I've broken it up. But I think it's worthwhile to hear it because it uh, sets the stage for what's to come. It's an interdisciplinary field of research and clinical applications focused on the repair, replacement, or regeneration of cells, tissues, or organs to restore impaired function from any cause. It combines converging technological approaches, both existing and newly emerging, moving it beyond traditional transplantation and replacement therapies. Mm -hmm. Regenerative medicine approaches often aim to stimulate and support the body's own self-healing capacity. The approaches may include soluble molecules, gene therapy, stem and progenitor cell therapy, tissue engineering, and the reprogramming of cell and tissue types. So that's some advanced stuff there. So this is uh, Dr. Anthony Atala, who, uh, who I understand is a very good researcher. Uh, basically, he's the head of the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine. He's a pediatric urologist by training. And uh, his lab is concerned with tissue engineering and printable organs. So, I mean, he's got tons of papers in this field, and he's probably one of the leading experts in the world on it. And he's a urologist. Three areas that uh, regenerative medicine has applications to urology are certainly organ transplantation. Having an endless supply of organs would be an amazing thing. Reconstructive procedures, not having to take the bowel out, just to have a, a, something you can take off the shelf and put into somebody, that'd be an amazing thing as well and chronic illness, curing it before you even have to go to operating. These are all sort of dreams of regenerative medicine. And we'll see how close we are to achieving these throughout the talk. So again, it's an interdisciplinary field. And the three areas that I'm going to focus on of it are cell-based therapy, biomaterial-based therapy, and tissue engineering. So cell-based therapy, basically we're talking about stem cells here for the most part. Uh, that's where we transplant cells to replace or repair diseased tissue. Now the cells can come from yourself, they can come from somebody else, an embryo per se. They can be pluripotent, meaning they can differentiate into the three germ layers. They can be multipotent, meaning they're a little farther down the differentiation line. You get the idea. So cell-based therapy, there's not too many applications in urology at this point, but certainly uh, we know of it in hematological malignancies and stem cell transplants. And there's a few different other fields that has, uh, has applications as well. But there's challenges to this therapy. Rejection's an issue, post-integration, targeting cells to the proper place, and of course, malignancy. These cells have a chance to uh, turn into anything, especially when they're clearly potent. Teratomas are known to form from those particular cells. So biomaterial-based therapy, the second thing. Uh, this is in vivo, so laboratory tissue, or in life tissue repair, 
by ingrowth of host cells onto an acellular matrix. And there's multiple different types of acellular, acellular matrixes that are around. The ideal biomaterial, it should be biocompatible, bioresorbable, minimally immunogenic, so not too much of an inflammatory reaction, and it should integrate nicely into the local environment and provide a nice matrix for growth and development. So current applications in urology, um, I know we don't do a lot of these uh, particular applications here in Vancouver, but uh, this was a nice little chart from Davis et al, who uh, talk a lot about the SIS grafting and they talking about placing it on partial nephrectomy sites, which I, I never knew that was uh, possible, and just some other applications for it. But again, these have challenges as well. Uh, fibrosis is a big issue. If you put a large biomaterial acellular scaffold on, it's hard for those cells to grow into that. And often fibrosis takes over before things can happen. Breakdown occurs. And of course, a lot of these are xenogenic. So they come from animals and sometimes cells are left over and sometimes our body does not like those cells. So tissue engineering, that's the main part of this talk. And that's really sort of the exciting part of uh, regenerative medicine to me anyway. So it's the process of creating living, functional tissues to repair or replace tissue or organ function lost due to age, disease, damage, or congenital defects. The components of it are cells, scaffolds, and bioactive factors. So in terms of cells, these are often obtained through biopsy. They can be autologous, and this is the best thing because those are our cells, they're coming back to us. It's a good thing, but sometimes if we want to take a diseased tissue, we might have to go looking for cells elsewhere. We can have other autologous stem cells throughout the body. There's lots of uh, research in adipose mesenchymal stem cells right now, um, but they can also be from another person of our species or from an animal or something else. So scaffolds are the second part of tissue engineering. This is a 3D, 3D matrix, and its purpose is to adhere, allow cells to proliferate, and migrate, and differentiate so that they can have a functional tissue grown in the laboratory. So bioactive factors are the last important component, and these include growth factors. And there's a lot of research going into which of these growth factors can really help get engineered tissue. Cell adhesion molecules are vitally important to allow cells to bind to the scaffolds. There's other proteins that are very important down here. And of course, bioactive factors can be loaded along with the cells and scaffolds to help regulate cellular function. So you put it all together. Tissue engineering is basically, we take a biopsy, we isolate the cells, we grow them how we want, put them on a scaffold, put them in an incubator, throw on some growth factors and some other substances, and bam, we have some tissue after that that we can hopefully put back into a person and help them live their life better. So bladder augmentation is one area I wanted to focus on because it's, it's an area that actually has some, uh, some research to go along with it in terms of regenerative medicine. So we all know the bladder is a complex organ that functions as a low pressure High capacity reservoir. Sorry, I can't read my presenter notes, but I will. It normally functions. We all know what the bladder is. That's the bottom line. But it's a complex organ. It's got neural pathways, bladder smooth muscle, urothelium, and of course the urinary sphincters. And these all have to interplay together for proper function. So in pediatrics, neurogenic bladder is a huge thing. One of the most common causes is meningomyelocele. There's also other causes, all basically related to some sort of neurogenic abnormality. You have this classic Christmas tree pattern on cystogram, and oftentimes you'll have urodynamic studies that show hostile uh, parameters with high pressures in the bladder. Pediatric neurogenic bladder, the characteristics, again, are high filling pressure, poor compliance and capacity, overactivity and incontinence. Treatment goals, preserve renal function, prevent urinary tract infections, and preserve continence if possible. So the evolution of management has gone through quite a change. Initially, it was diversion was the option. 
Then continuous intermittent catheterization came into play. Then augmentation started coming around. Then a Mitrofenoff was found. Then we found out some medical management via Botox and some anticholinergics. So it's come a long way in terms of the management that we can do for these children. I, th I found this really interesting to go into the actual history of augmentation cystoplasty. It's really neat. I, I was amazed to see that in 1899, there was a bladder extrophy. Two different surgeons performed uh, enterocystoplasty at this time. And that's still our gold standard today for, uh, for augmentation. Gastrocystoplasty was tried, but it was uh, wrought with uh, complications. So it was basically abandoned as far as I'm aware. Ureterocystoplasty, that was a great idea because it's the urothelium that's on the ureter. But the problem is the blood supply is very tenuous and you can only really take that ureter if it's dilated and you have a non-functioning kidney up top unless you do some fancy tricks. So there's only a few specific indications you can use that for, but it can be good if you can use it. Auto augmentation's been tried. That's where you basically take the detrusor off and let a diverticulum form. But again, the results haven't been as uh, impressive as, as we would hope. Seromuscular enterocystoplasty was a thought to preserve the urothelium on the inside and to put bowel on the outside to provide a little bit more of a functional bladder. But again, that's not had the results that we would like. And then they've tried a whole host of other things. So you can see there's been a real search for the appropriate material. But enterocystoplasty still is the gold standard today, over a hundred years after it was invented. It's strange when we think about it, the bowel that's in the urinary tract sort of has opposing interests. Intestines absorb, urothelium sort of just stores and gets rid. So complications include mucus, bacterial colonization, electrolyte imbalances, and we all in urology need to know this chart. If regenerative medicine happens, maybe we won't need to know that chart. That'd be great. Metabolic acidosis is something that can occur. Somatic growth retardation. Vitamin B12 deficiency, because we often take the ileum. Bladder stones, as you see here. And malignancy. And there's some reports saying that malignancy may not be increased. It may be the actual underlying condition that causes the increased malignancy. I saw one paper on that, but in general, it's, it's accepted that there's an increased uh, malignancy risk. So the ideal material was thought in 1955 by Shoemaker to include it be easily available, allow for large areas to be used, easily mobilized without jeopardizing blood supply, allow regrowth of urothelium, have sufficient pliability to assume the shape of the bladder, have an inherent functioning bladder layer, not absorb electrolytes or nitrogenous waste, not produce mucus or irritating substances. Well, all of the ones we've gone through so far, they don't meet that ideal material. Tissue engineered bladder augment, the goal would be to meet that ideal standard. You could avoid the complications associated <laughs> with enterocystoplasty. And there's a couple approaches that uh, you can do an acellular approach or a cellular approach. Now the acellular approach, the theory is, put on a scaffold and cells will come to it and cover it and hopefully just regenerate the smooth muscle cells of the detrusor and the urothelium. That'd be the ideal situation. Uh, SIS and BSM have been widely explored. Uh, these are just the acellular matrixes produced from a xenogenic type of uh, manner. But unfortunately, these non-seated scaffolds, they, they don't uh, get that ingrowth of cells like they like you think they should, and mainly the big issue is the size of these scaffolds. It's just too big for proper ingrowth more often than not. There's extensive scarring with the grafts, and the urine causes a reaction that's uh, not favorable to that graft surviving. So the cellular approach is something that's got a lot of interest of late. Uh, basically, that's that exact same chart of tissue engineering we just went through. Take a biopsy, grow it, put it on a scaffold, throw in some factors, and create the, uh, the tissue that you want. There's been a comparison study. This is an animal study. I didn't want to put too many animal studies in there because I like the, the human studies, but this is the only one I could find comparing acellular to cellular technique. Basically, in canine model, 
they looked at subtotal cystectomy, subtotal cystectomy with a non-seeded scaffold and then one with a seeded scaffold. The seeded scaffold, 95% of the original capacity was obtained and they had nice histology when they looked under the microscope at the biopsies. The non-seeded scaffold, only about half of the original capacity was obtained and there was just a minor bit of ingrowth so the histology was not quite right. And in terms of uh, nothing put on, as we would expect, it's quite, quite small. So this brings us to our first big clinical trial in uh, regenerative medicine. So this is Dr. Atala and his group, and they're looking at tissue-engineered autologous bladders for patients needing cystoplasty. So they initially had nine patients, and two of them were lost to follow-up. But basically, these people met requirements to go on to get a cystoplasty. So basically, they failed uh, pharmacologic interventions and they're having ongoing issues. So basically, they had an engineered human bladder tissue, took a biopsy of their urothelia muscle cells. And this was done in an open manner through an incision in the belly. They expanded these cells. They attached these cells to a matrix. And then they implanted them. And one thing that's a bit of a problem with the study is they changed their methods as they went on. The first four patients had collagen. The fourth patient had no mental wrap on top of it because they wanted to increase the vascularization. The last three patients had this composite collagen and polyglycolic acid matrix. And they all in those last three patients had the uh, uh, omentum flopped on top for increased vascularity. So we can see some pictures here. On the uh, a, a picture here, that's the actual tissue grown, and you can see that sort of scaffold that's there. It's just a, just a firm structure ready to go. This is it implanting into the bladder, and there's the omentum flap coming into play. So they had a mean follow-up of 46 months, so decent follow-up. There were no metabolic complications at all, so they had av avoided the uh, enterocystoplasty complications. Renal function was preserved. There was no mucus production, and there was no stones that had formed. Um, when we have a look at their capacity preoperatively and their capacity postoperatively, if we look at the collagen group, there's really not that much difference between the two groups. If we look at the, uh, the three that got the uh, composite, there is, actually is a, a bit of a difference between their pre- and post-op capacity. So here's a little picture just of, uh, this is one of the later people. Uh, they always took the best person for uh, these pictures. But you can see a nice, more round bladder compared to this oblong bladder. A little more hostile urodynamics, a nice low pressures on that urodynamic study. Basically, their conclusion was composite scaffolds with a mental flap provide the best results. They felt this was an important step in evaluating the transfer of tissue engineering technology to the clinical setting. However, other authors would say that the improvements in capacity are not the same as those achieved by our gold standard that's currently here. It's still an important study in regenerative medicine. This was a very recent study, May 2014. This was a phase two study looking at uh, uh, children and adolescents with spina bifida. So this was uh, a pharma company. Basically, this is the big company, Tengion who's looking at all these re regenerative medicine things, and we'll talk about them again in a sec. Uh, but basically, this study used autologous, seeded, biodegradable scaffolds for bladder augmentation. These were children who met the criteria to go on to cystoplasty, and their primary and secondary outcomes were change in compliance, capacity, and safety. The results, the compliance was mildly improved in half of the patients, but not significantly in terms of the statistics. There was no change in capacity. There was serious adverse events in, this, in these groups. Uh, four patients had either a serious bowel obstruction or a bladder rupture. So their conclusion was there was no improvement in compliance or capacity. Serious adverse events surpassed acceptable safety standards. Uh, when you look at that compared to the previous study, the previous study painted that such a good light, and then this study is a bit disastrous for, uh, for these young kids. So that, that's all I want to say about bladder augmentation. I just want to do a quick uh, overview of urologic tissue engineering as a whole. And you'll notice I didn't put the ureter in there. There's a few animal studies on the ureter, but they've all like failed, and I didn't think it was worth going there. Uh, so we'll go through uh, just some, some current research in these uh, particular areas. 
So in terms of the lower urinary tract, I want us to just stick with the bladder for a second. Uh, bladder cancer is a big deal. Imagine if we could take out the bladder and create a new bladder in the lab and put it back in. We're nowhere near doing that, not even close. But, I mean, that's the dream of regenerative medicine. It'd be amazing. Still, we take out people's bladders all the time for bad disease. And the options, the three main options that uh, I thought of and that were in the literature is uh, incontinent ileoconduit, continent cutaneous diversion, something like an Indiana pouch, or an orthotopic neobladder. All of these, again, use bowel, and there's always complications when you use bowel in the urinary tract. So here's a study basically looking at the regenerative medicine and the management of invasive bladder cancer. This was more of a review study, but it talked about this new concept about an ileoconduit that's lab-grown. So imagine doing a cystectomy, and you can just pull off this, this ileoconduit off the shelf, which is grown right here, and boom, pop it in without having to do any of the bowel stuff. It'd be amazing. Basically, it's Tengion again, who's doing this neourinary conduit, uh, and they're basically, they've got a phase one trial underway right now, and they were able to do this phase one trial because they had a positive uh, animal study in a porcine cystectomy model using these conduits. They seem to be uh, decently accepted in this, that group, so now they've gone on to the phase one trial. Um, I went on the, uh, the website there to see exactly what they're, what they're doing with it. They want to get 10 patients, and it seems like they keep expanding. I, I think they've been having a really tough time recruiting 10 patients for this particular study. Uh, but basically, what they're doing is they're taking autologous smooth muscle cells from fat biopsy, and they're growing these just like we do for every tissue, genera tissue engineering thing we do, and they're putting this onto a composite scaffold. Their primary outcome, they want to see how functional these are. Are they, are they uh, strong and sturdy? And are they open? And they estimate this will be done in 2017. So there's no data to report on this, but it's a, it's a cool idea. And it's something that's going to, we're going to hear something about it down the road. The urethra. There's, there's quite a bit of research on the urethra as well. This is probably the most, second most research in regenerative medicine secondary to bladder augmentation. So stricture disease, hypospadias, there's a bit of research on both of these. Basically, there can be biomaterial-based therapy where it's acellular or you can do a cellular scaffold type lab-grown therapy. So the biomaterial-based therapy, it's an acellular collagen matrix in an on-lay fashion for creation of a neourethra. So in hypospadias, Atala's group had another study. They had four boys with failed hypospadias repair and they had three successes in a mean of 22 months. And the other guy did have a fistula and he had to get reoperated on. In urethral stricture, l Casabi, that's also a Talos group, uh, basically there were 28 patients with anterior urethral strictures, and this was an on-lay fashion again. 24 were successful and had patent urethras. The complications that did occur were scarring and fistula formation. So here's another Atala group paper. They're very big into this urethra research. They basically looked at tissue engineering for those who need it. This is basically stricture disease, and these were, were decent uh, strictures in young boys. They were autologous cells they took, and they, of course, did our usual tissue engineering techniques. You can see the boys. They were all sort of traumatic urethral strictures, and their defects were four to six centimeters long, and the follow-up was quite decent. So the results... The flow rates for all of them were greatly improved from preoperative uh, standpoints. There was only one patient who was just over the 10 mark. I think they marked him at about 15 maximum flow rate, but uh, certainly everyone was improved in the follow-up. You can see uh, the urethrogram here. There's the pre-op. There's the post-op. Cystoscopy, there's the pre-op. Can't get anything through that. Post-op, it looks nice and patent, patent. And then you can see the interoperative on lay and then it's covered up. So their conclusion on this was tissue engineered urethras can be used for stricture repair with good results at six years follow-up. That's sort of a common theme with the Talos group. They always, it's always pretty positive stuff they put the spin on. Um, here's another study 
for hypospadias repair, six patients, cells harvested by catheterization and bladder lavage, typical tissue engineering techniques. Three of these patients developed a fistular stricture. So too high, too high. So urethral sphincter. Stress urinary continence is the big thing that regenerative medicine is looking at right now. Uh, there's no actual treatments for it yet. Um, currently, we can do conservative or surgical options. Um, the idea that they're looking at right now is stem cell injection into the external urethral sphincter. Uh, this bent at all. Uh, they looked at these ear-derived autologous chondrocytes for periurethral injection into 32 women, and they found that 80% of them had symptomatic improvement at 12 months. Um, I saw some commentaries later. They think probably most of this is related to the bulking factor rather than any actual change in the uh, external urethral sphincter at all. Caradol, there was autologous muscle-derived cells for intra- and periurethral injection in eight women. One year follow-up in five women, they lost three to follow-up. One was dry and four were improved. So not, not amazing results on that either. But again, it's probably mostly due to the bulking factor. So the upper urinary tract. I just want to touch on the kidney really quickly. Uh, so basically, chronic kidney disease, end-stage renal disease, it's a big issue, and we deal with that a lot in urology. Dialysis and renal transplantation. Uh, basically, there's an organ shortage. There's much more people, there's much more demand than supply. And dialysis is sort of uh, a terminal condition unless you can get off it. So regenerative medicine approaches to the kidney include cell therapies to regenerate renal function at an early stage of chronic kidney disease. So again, Tengion's got a phase one trial going on right now. It's got the neo kidney augment. It's made from expanded autologous renal cells obtained by kidney biopsy and then they put it back into the kidney uh, but basically they're looking for those healthy kidney cells and hopefully the stem cells that can uh, improve the environment of that diseased kidney. Their goal is to delay the loss of renal function. Again it's phase one there's no data on that yet. 2015 is when we'll hear something about that unless it gets pushed back. Now this is a phase two trial. This is actually an, a neat little trial. This is, was in the ICU setting for acute renal failure and basically, they were looking at people who had acute renal failure requiring continuous renal replacement therapy. They did a two-to-one randomization where half the patients got this, uh, this RAD technique. This RAD, what does RAD mean again? I had it there somewhere. Basically, they're renal cells is what they are. Uh, basically, they've got cultured renal cells and they put it in a hemodialysis machine and the idea with this is that these are going to perform absorptive, metabolic, endocrine, and immu immunologic functions that normal hemodialysis just can't form. So their primary endpoint was all-cause mortality. And they actually found improved survival, quite, quite a bit of improved survival in those people who were getting those renal cells, their blood running through the renal cells to potentially get some of these functions and their kidneys actually improved more rapidly. So that was, that's an interesting study. <coughs> but actual clinical applications for this right now, not so much. Uh, reproductive tract, quick, quick blurb on that. Uh, erectile dysfunction is something that's being studied in regenerative medicine. High prevalence of ED in older males, as we know. Uh, we have pr decent treatments for erectile dysfunction at the current time. Um, but the research is looking at uh, can they engineer a penile prosthesis that's more natural than the ones we're currently using? Can they just implant stem cells to make uh, those erections better? And uh, of course, the corporal smooth muscle is something else they're looking into. So I just want to touch on, this is another recent study. There's lots of stuff coming out recently. Um, and this is again a Talas group. But this is uh, looking at four girls with uh, basically agenesis of the vagina. And basically, they reconstructed this, these vaginas with uh, tissue engineering techniques. And then they had good follow-up. The follow-up was from five to eight years. And they wanted to see how they did. So that's just some just basic characteristics of the girls. And you can see the follow-up there. Nice long follow-up. So you can really get a good idea. And then we have some imaging of, uh, of how they're doing. Basically, if you look up here, you can't really see uh, much in the way of a vagina at all. 
But if you look down here, there's a nice, nice black box there, nice black there, and there, and there. All four of them appear to have a have a nicely patent vagina at this time. So this study found there were no long-term complications. The vaginas they felt were histologically and functionally normal. They actually took samples and examined them, and they had all the cell layers of a typical vagina. Not quite the organization that you would see, but still pretty impressive. And uh, so far, they've deemed this a great success to date. And these girls, there's actually like sexual questionnaires they did in the study, and the girls were very happy with their sexual function, and uh, sounds, sounds pretty impressive on paper. Um, so some roadblocks, just to touch on very briefly. Uh, science. Uh, one of the big issues I kept reading about was uh, getting proper vascularization into these uh, tissue implants that come on. There's lots of different uh, these bioactive peptides and everything that we've been talking about, but for whatever reason, sometimes the vascularization of these these cannot be uh, achieved enough. So that's why the omental flaps a good idea. Any type of onlay flaps where you can get some more uh, vascularization to come in is a great idea. Uh, the ingrowth of nerves is also an issue just because we know nerves don't, uh, they aren't that plastic in nature, so uh, that's something they're working towards as well. And then organs are just complex. How are, how are they going to grow a whole organ when it's got so many different functions and so many different pieces? Um, so we're, we're quite a bit away from, from that particular dream at this point. Although there is, uh, you saw Dr. Atala holding his kidney in his hand, and there's some uh, reports saying that uh, they've actually um, had some functional renal nephrons where they can actually run fluid through and see it come out and get it filtered. But, uh, but actual clinical applications, not quite there yet. Uh, ethics is a big issue in uh, this type of things. When we already have good treatments for certain conditions and they're socially acceptable to people, it's hard to say, well, why do we need new ones? Uh, certainly, there's some of these that look really attractive. You know, I, I think the, the uh, augment and the cystectomy, to be able to not use the bowel in that, that'd be amazing. Um, to be have an endless supply of kidneys, that'd be amazing. But uh, some of the other ones, hard to say how, how effective they'll be. Uh, a lot of these issues are in pediatric populations, and there's always issues with that. Um, basically, uh, these engineered tissues, we don't know how they react once they get in the human body. That could be a big deal. Uh, there's no randomized control trials that have proven safety in a different population before trying it on these kids. And uh, informed consent is always an issue with the kids. Maybe these kids don't want these. And then there's regulatory groups who say you can and can't do stuff, and that's always a, a bit of an issue. So the future, hopefully we can do some organ creation. Uh, Dr. Atala's lab is doing this thing called bioprinting. Uh, it's a pretty cool idea. Uh, basically, have a, it's like an inkjet ink ink printer and they have like a 3D scaffold that they make, and then the ink jets have different cartridges and they each have different cell lines. They have like a smooth muscle cell line, a uh, epithelial line and something else, and they just ink jet it in in the, uh, the formation that they think that kidney should be in. So it's a, it's a pretty cool idea. Uh, they've got some functionality out of this, but uh, again, they're way off anything that's gonna be uh, usable. Um, but basically, I think this is the important point. The main goals moving forward are determining the optimum scaffold for cell seeding. We don't know what that is yet. Uh, what are the best source of stem cells? That's a huge area of research right now, and there's lots of uh, people looking into that. How can we optimally differentiate and define the stem cells? How can we make sure they become what, they, what we want them to without becoming something adverse like a malignancy? And finally, it's this nerve and neovascularization issue. How do we make sure that we get good ingrowth of blood vessels and nerves so we can potentially get that functional tissue that we want? So conclusions, regenerative medicine is an exciting interdisciplinary field that has the potential to revolutionize medicine. Not, it's not an evolution, it's a revolution if it was to work. Despite extensive research, the techniques have still not made a meaningful transition into urologic practice. The main role at the current time seems in cases when native tissues are not available or there's been some failed procedures. Thanks to Dr. Afshar and Dr. Black for uh, helping out uh, with some questions I had. Thanks, everyone.